storms, raging wildfires, virulent viruses, vicious floods, and dying wildlife. A global collapse that risks the lives and livelihoods of billions driven by the overconsumption and extraction of natural capital to surging economic growth. Through the Ecology is Economy thematic, the forum has become a platform for charting a strategy and building action networks for rewilding degraded lands across the region, including connecting interested investors and businesses to communities who can lead these rewilding programs. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC assessment is clear, adapt or die. The climate crisis already costs the world $200 billion annually because of ever worsening natural disasters. By 2050, climate inaction will cost the global economy around 23 trillion US dollars. So with this brief introduction, I would humbly uh, request Ambassador Ritayat Tariq Ahmed Karim, the Director, Center for Bay of Bengal Studies, Independent University of Bangladesh, the Chair of this panel discussion to come up on stage, sir. A round of applause for Ambassador Tariq Karim. We also have Ambassador Pranay Varma among us, who's the Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh, sir. A round of applause for him. We have His Excellency Robert Chatterton Dixon, the British High Commissioner to Bangladesh, sir. Thank you, sir. We have uh, Mr. Praveen Pratap Singh, Indian Administrative Service, Member Administration at Capacity Building Commission, Government of India. Thank you, sir. And we also have Mr. Vashkar Jyoti Fukon, Managing Director, Numalikar Refinery, India, to come up on stage and take your seats. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. And now I would like to humbly request Ambassador Tariq Ahmed Karim to moderate this session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Uh, this is the second session after the uh, uh, on, on the theme of ecology is economy, but the overall theme is rewilding the eastern Himalayas, valuing natural assets and building resilient landscapes. I think those few words are extremely heavily loaded. Each word has a whole chapter behind it. Uh, and I think we got a good introduction in the first, uh, uh, the, the early morning slide uh, uh, presentation made by uh, Praveen Pardeshi. Uh, what do we actually mean by rewilding? What is it that is involved? And he showed how the migratory patterns of birds and animals take place. And that is where I think the fundamental conflict between ecology and economy has occurred. Uh, Sir Partha Dashgupta in his address this morning, and I think we need to pay attention to that, that we are people, we human beings are embedded in nature. We are not something apart from nature. We are not external to nature. Nature depends on survival on us as we depend on our survival for nature. And this is something which we tend to forget in the constant tussle that takes place between uh, the demands for economic development and our own sustenance and the demand for maintaining biodiversity and some sort of uh, uh, equilibrium uh, that used to exist prehistorically and until not too long ago, uh, which held an ecological equilibrium in nature. 
you disturb equilibrium in any planetary system, the whole planetary system is going to go into a tailspin. It's the same within our own planet. The, there is a concept which I'd like to introduce to you to, to take note of mentally. It's, it's, not, it's a recently defined concept, recent in terms of maybe the last two decades. The concept of ecological integrity or ecological security. This is a subject, incidentally, which is taught as a separate subject on its own in many universities in the United States <clears throat> and in some universities <clears throat> in the European co continent. I have not, and I'm, I, I must say to my great disappointment, seen this feature in any curriculum of any university in South Asia. I stand subject to correction. Uh, we have environmental economics and environmental science and environmental engineering and all that. We tend to forget that the environment is a part of the ecology. The ecology is not, sub, is, is not subservient to the ecology is the overall uh, 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 format within which environment is a huge part. Integral to the ecology is human beings, because we are the dominant species. Homo sapiens has emerged as the dominant species. Whether fortunately or unfortunately remains to be seen. Uh, we may be the cause of our own extinction if we carry on destroying nature. Uh, that's a very personal opinion. Uh, but uh, uh, ecological security in very simple terms is defined as an equilibrium that exists between man and man, man and other species, between other species, between flora and fauna, between pathogens and other species. And unless we re recognize that these species coexist, how we learn to live with them, we are going to disturb the equilibrium which will create chaos. The tension between the, the, the arguments, the juxtaposed arguments, economic versus biodiversity, these continue even today, even in the discourses today. How do we reconcile them? That was the question, fundamental question raised by Sarpartho. We need to answer that, uh, address that, if not answer that meaningfully. Uh, with those words, uh, they, there are uh, several sets of questions which I think the participants have also received, uh, uh, which were the guideline questions given by the sponsors. So I'm going to throw them out, but I'm not going to ask you to be in a straitjacket within those questions. I'd like you to address the overall question, your, your views on how you see uh, the, the importance of this theme for this today, rewilding the Eastern Himalayas, valuing the natural asset and building resilient landscapes. And uh, as we, uh, this is a conversational format. Uh, I don't think there are any presentations as far as I'm concerned, I've been told. So uh, let me start from my right. And uh, if, if you could take maybe three to four minutes with your opening thoughts. Uh, very good afternoon. And at the onset, I would like to express my gratitude for having me here, thanks to Balipara Foundation. And uh, no tape topic can be more relevant than what is being discussed here. Only it seems that I am an odd man out. I am from a fossil fuel industry. So we do refining for our living, but we are also in the business of giving energy security, not only to our nation, we are trying to also help Bangladesh now currently supplying them uh, some diesel oil. That being the case, we are in the forefront of the climate uh, resilient energy supply chain. 
the the uh, the moot point is that we have to go through a transition process wherein the whole energy uh, business has to be greened that means you have to go for renewables you have the hydrogen will take over some, after some time solar is already there but intervening period you cannot wish away the presence of hydrocarbon that be the case how responsible we can be during this transition period that is the question that i would like to address we have been constantly fighting uh, with how to decarbonize our own uh, kind of a business so that is the focus of uh, what we do and what we have been doing almost for last decade when we started benchmarking our energy consumption with the world standard we were at a very low we were in the fourth quartile in 2010 assessment now we have moved to uh, almost the first quartile that means in a small refinery like us that is 3 million ton refinery that we operate in middle part of assam uh, we have been able to save around 96000 ton of fuel every year by only energy consumption measure that means it involve lot of uh, in depth studying of our processes wherein we use waste energy to heat up the process fluid and all so that itself uh, saves lot of carbon dioxide being em emitted that is one part of the story second part government of india has encouraged us to go for biofuel now why biofuel see if we have been encouraged to produce ethanol bioethanol from a 2g biomass that means not food grade biomass and we have chosen bamboo as that biomass why bamboo bamboo is in plentiful in uh, that part of the country north is part of the country we have almost 500 million ton of bamboo which is already available and bamboo is renewable because uh, bamboo goes grows back in 4 years into full bloom so a plan that we are trying to make is to convert this bamboo into ethanol now you compare gasoline versus ethanol gasoline will have a carbon number ranging from products ranging from 2 to 12 that means gasoline being a mixture of lot of compounds it will have a carbon upward in a upscale of around 12 uh, carbon whereas ethanol will have two carbon so on intermediate basis if we also add ethanol to gasoline that will reduce carbon dioxide emission that is the thought process where government of india has pushed us to blend ethanol into gasoline and we are at 10% and we will be come 2024 we will be at 20% so therefore our main uh, our main focus do i am a refiner our now main focus is to produce 60000 ton of ethanol from bamboo and for that we have to regrow i am using the word regrow because whatever harvesting that we are going to do for uh, bamboo we have to replenish it two crore of bamboo poles we have to replenish every year for which we went backward to build the ecosystem from the tissue culture lab to secondary hardening to replantation so this is the effort that we have done one reduce the uh, fuel consumption drastically in the refineries that we have second also go for bioethanol which can go for blend blending this will at least reduce the uh, carbon intensity of the economy in the interim till the time we get whole hog into uh, renewable thank you thank you very much mr pukhan uh, i think you you raised a interesting uh, point about we were discussing it last night also when we were sitting uh at the dinner about the use of bamboo to to produce the fuel that we need and there is a, a fuel crunch today globally and in a sense because the uh global uh, supply chains have sort of collapsed all of us are going to face this crunch uh, winter is going to be severe in many parts of the world and i think we will in south asia we will not be unaffected by it it's already started in in the northern hemisphere uh so the sooner we can make this transition we cannot take the great leap forward and completely switch from hard hydrocarbons to uh, clean energy uh, we have to do it in phases but the faster we go that was the theme which was raised yesterday in shorav's opening address uh, we have to think big to which i had added we have to run faster uh, i think that is the imperative uh 
I uh, would like to invite now uh, High Commissioner Verma uh, for your thoughts. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this is uh, uh, really a great opportunity for us to uh, talk about something that binds us all together in this region, which is our uh, shared uh, biodiversity, our shared ecology, and our shared uh, environmental uh, heritage and its future. Uh, I'll, as an opening uh, point, I will uh, I will touch upon four four uh, themes. Sir. One is that. Uh, uh, there is indeed a growing consciousness about uh, ecological preservation in our discourse, uh, whether it has translated down to the uh, level of uh, action at the at the very foundation of our uh, uh, society and economy. That's a, that's a different question, but definitely there is a there is a, a much uh, heightened level of uh, awareness about the need for that discussion. Uh, in, in whatever we do today. And this conference is an example uh, where we are sitting in, in, in Dhaka discussing uh, uh, ecologic, ecology and in, in, you know, uh, environment uh, together with uh, our partners. Uh, the second point uh, uh, I will make is that in many of our, in, the, in this region, and I'll talk about uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, you know, I'm not an environmental expert, so my perspective to it is informed by my my own uh, diplomatic experiences and I see that uh, uh, happening in both our countries where uh, inclusive and sustainable development are the uh, defining themes of how we look at the future of our governance and even the focus of our governance today. Um, inclusive development to ensure that uh, we have equitable access for everyone to uh, what entails development for its sustainability and also sustainable development in the sense that it has to be ecologically sensitive for its uh, 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 sustenance. So uh, mainstream of economic, uh, ec ecological and environmental issues in our uh, economic and developmental policies, I think is, is increasingly visible. Uh, in India's case, of course, uh, you know, we always talk about what you mentioned about ecological integrity and uh, that suddenly threw up in my mind something like ecological or environmental ethics, you know, where you are duty bound to look at environmental or ecological repercussions of your action or your policies. And that has been captured and in what Prime Minister uh, uh, Modi always mentions about uh, India's age-old civilizational respect for nature. And uh, I think that is getting uh, now increasing uh, a play in the policy pronouncements. And an example of that is uh, the recent campaign that Prime Minister launched uh, named LIFE. It's called Lifestyle uh, for Environment. It, it's an acronym for that. It's essentially a, a, a very different from previous approaches to ecological discourse where policies are set at broad macro level and then we expect a trickle down effect of that to happen uh, in our uh, implementing actions. Uh, life is essentially more of a, a bottom-up approach where you generate incentives for people to make lifestyle choices which then contributes to sustainable ecological uh, 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 development and coexistence of uh, human endeavors and, and, and environment. So that's something that I think we probably need to look at when we are talking about innovative ways of uh, 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 mainstreaming uh, ecology and environmental concerns in our uh, discussions and actions. And the third point I will make is about the need for equitable access. And I think often in the a discussion on environment will lose sight of the fact that equitable access of resources is an important enabler for sustainable development to take place. And I'll give you examples of many initiatives that we have taken in India. Uh, for example, uh, initiatives which are geared towards uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, um, Ujala, which is a campaign's name, it's a, it's a, it's a Hindi word which translates uh, roughly as illumination, where we have given uh, some three, nearly 400 million LED bulbs uh, for usage in household, which has 
which itself has created a huge amount of uh, reduction in uh, carbon emissions per year. Uh, similarly, 80 million households be below poverty line have been given uh, um, clean uh, cooking fuel, which has again contributed significantly to reduction of carbon emissions. And the water uh, resources, you know, uh, given the fact that we are all heading towards a future with uh, water insecurity looming large, uh, the the mi mission that we have is it's called Jal Jeevan Mission, which is uh, uh, water is life mission, where we are looking at bringing tap water, clean water access for all by 2024. So I think, it, you know, uh, policy and uh, action in, uh, oriented uh, 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 programs uh, which which provide equitable access to resources to people are very important tools when we are talking about ecological and environmental protection and sustainable development and uh, um, the last thing i will uh, like to mention about uh, you know you mentioned about thinking big yes i think we are thinking big and uh, renewable energy, uh, different sources of renewable energy are in fact becoming increasingly vital components of our uh, energy mix. And uh, you know, if you look at some of the targets that we have announced for COP26, uh, where we are looking at 500 gigawatt of, uh, of energy uh, in our energy mix from renewable energy, different sources of uh, 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 renewable energy resources, and also the many global collaborative uh, 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 platforms that we have launched uh, together with other partner countries such as Solar Alliance, International Solar Alliance, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure with, with Britain uh, and, uh, and many other initiatives are clearly, it, 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 it shows the, that we are uh, definitely looking, uh, uh, thinking big um, and you, uh, how far we take the collaboration together really depends on building that coalition together and uh, we look at bangladesh as an important partner in that effort so, thank you thank you very much high commissioner and and i i uh, particularly uh, uh, am heartened by by uh, the remarks that we have to think collaboratively and and you uh, you know you refer to the bangladesh uh, partnership with bangladesh in uh, addressing some of these issues I think this is going to be extremely important as we go forward when we are thinking about rewilding the Eastern uh, Himalayas and the, and the theme of uh, the whole conference, uh, uh, the economy, uh, ecology's economy. Uh, we cannot think in isolation. This is, I think, number one. We became Westphalian states. We defined very hard, impermeable borders uh, uh, post the, the change of the international order post-1945 uh, in basically an area where there was no sense of border for centuries. People knew where they lived, they respected them. Uh, th this was, it, it was pointed out yesterday that this was one integrated ecosystem. And subsequent, it was also an integrated economy. Uh, when we disrupted the means of communications with each other, between peoples, because the borders had become very hard and impermeable, then we started doing damage to ourselves. And I think we are beginning to realize now that we did grave damage and injustice to ourselves, and <clears throat> we are trying to recapture those lost spaces. The, the challenge is how we are going to go forward. <clears throat> The, the ecosystem that we share are commons. We have to find out how we can collaborate in managing these commons. And in, in this respect, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's not the forestry, it's the wildlife. The wildlife knows no uh, territorial boundaries. They migrate at a will. They have uh, migratory patterns, whether it's for mating or for seeking new uh, pastures. Uh, similarly, if we disrupt that, then then right life is going to turn on the humans who have disrupted that. That is a phenomenon which you face in India, which we have faced in Bangladesh, uh, uh, and, and will continue to face. Uh, I've served in Africa, and, and I've visited the parks over there. They, they have uh, these Westphalian borders drawn across the, bar, uh, across the map, 
But insofar as the management of the parks are concerned, there are no boundaries. The animals roam freely. I have driven from Pretoria right up to uh, Windhoek through the Kalahari Desert. No boundaries, no border police, no customs anywhere. Uh, that is the system which we have to get used to. And, and, and uh, it used to be, we used to be used to it, we destroyed that. And so uh, recently, uh, and I turn now to uh, the uh, distinguished British High Commissioner here, my good friend, Robert Chatterton Dixon. Uh, you, were in, you actually helped two organizations, us and ORF, to do uh, an assessment of where Bangladesh and India were on managing the Sundarbans, because we do have an agreement on joint management of the Sundarban. The Sundarban is a very, very important ecosystem. And it, it falls within the context of the mangrove forest, which used to typify the entire coastal belt of the Bay of Bengal, all the countries. We should ask ourselves the, coastal, uh, the, the question, why is it surviving only in Bangladesh, in West Bengal, and parts of the Arakan coast? Why has it disappeared elsewhere? Uh, is it because cash crops have supplanted them? We have some evidence of that happening slowly within Bangladesh also. Uh, the mangroves are very important for nature, for primary. Mangroves are everywhere where there's saltwater bodies around them. Every country has some species of mangroves or the other. Mangroves sequester three to four times the carbon that other trees do. So that's a huge sequestering carbon sink area that they form by there. The UAE is <clears throat> didn't have much of mangroves. They have actually started cultivating and regenerating mangrove because they realize the importance. They have a desert climate. They need the, the mangroves to be there to change the climatic pattern. That's foresight, I would say. That's visionary. We have been losing a mangroves. In the last 150 years, we have lost 50% of the mangroves. And if, if we continue with this, the, the uh, debate between <coughs> economics <coughs> and ecology uh, continues with ecology losing, then it won't take 50 years for us to lose the rest of the mangroves. And uh, incidentally, the mangroves also put back into the atmosphere three to four times more oxygen than the normal trees do. So that's a double whammy effect when we get rid of the mangroves. And I wish I could call on all the countries to start regenerating the mangroves. Indonesia has tried that. After they got rid of it, the populations in the coastal area started protesting. So they started rewilding. But it was a constant tussle between those who wanted mangroves there and those who said, no, we want cash crops here. So that's a debate. And so with that, we also come to the question raised earlier this morning. Uh, it was raised by one of my colleagues in the International Center for Climate Change and Development, Professor Mitzan Rahman. We need to perhaps change the context of our curriculum. And this context have, has to be changed, not at the tertiary level, it has to be changed at the primary level because people who come to the tertiary level learn certain things from their home and the primary level. And then the ideas become formed within the 10 to 12 years it takes for them to come up. Then it's very difficult to change those ideas. We learned about basic need for respect for nature when we were children, but I think that's been lost. So in a sense, what would you share your ideas Sir Robert, about what we do. Yeah, thank you very much, Tariq. I'd just say, I mean, first of all, thank you very much to the Balipara Foundation for convening this event, and thank you very much to Sapata Das Gupta for coming, because Sapata is obviously a legendary figure in the world of, um, of ecology and economy, and it's great to have him here today from his base in Cambridge. Uh, and I think what his talk did more than anything was just remind us about how, in a sense, we now know what the problems are and what the, some of the solutions are, but there's really, really deep cultural change that has to be driven. Uh, and I think it's very interesting, as he said, that his report was actually based in the Treasury. Uh, the Foreign Office and the Treasury are nearly always at odds in the British government, and I know how steely the Treasury are. Uh, and I think it's very good, actually, that they remain engaged in driving this, this work forward.
But what I would just mention briefly this morning are some of the things that we're already doing, because this is actually, climate is one of the major pillars of the relationship between the UK and Bangladesh. And it's a relationship where we aren't always completely eye to eye on everything with the government here, but we are always very much eye to eye on climate and environment. And Bangladesh was one of the countries that signed up at COP to the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Halting Deforestation, which we hope will play a really significant role in preserving the 17, preserving and expanding the 17% of Bangladesh that remains forested today. And that followed a pledge made the previous year to the Leaders Pledge for Nature, uh, which brought together leaders from 85 countries and the 30 by 30 commitment to protect 30% of land and seas for nature by 2030. So a lot of the sort of political commitment uh, is there already, but government can only do so much. And uh, it's really crucial, I think, that the private sector is also involved. So it's been very good to see uh, people from both the financial and the industrial side of the private sector taking part in this event. Um, it's particularly important that we're meeting now because the 15th conference of the parties, COP15, on biological diversity is actually underway uh, in the next couple of weeks in Montreal. And this is obviously another opportunity after COP27, the Conference of the Parties on Climate a couple of weeks ago. Now we have the 15th COP, Conference of the Parties on Biological Diversity meeting in Montreal. And that's a really important overlap in terms of this agenda, trying to bring the sort of economic and ecological arguments together. And what we're doing there is we are working with uh, Ecuador, Gabon, and the Maldives uh, on a plan for financing biodiversity. And once we have that plan launched, which we'll be doing at Montreal, I will definitely be working with the government here to see how the Bangladesh government, which, as I said, takes these issues extremely seriously, uh, can uh, engage uh, on that as well. But I'd just like to mention a couple of other things. One is that, as I said, climate is a really important part of our overall relationship with Bangladesh. And we launched at COP last year in Glasgow uh, a climate and environment, but the Bangladesh Climate and Environment Program, which we're going to be doing together, uh, which is very much committed to nature and improving resilience of some of the climate vulnerable areas of Bangladesh, and is going to particularly be focused on the Sundarbans, which you've already mentioned, and is clearly absolutely vital uh, as a nature-based solution right here in Bangladesh, as well as being an amazing environment, which I've been lucky enough to visit on several occasions. But we're also going to be working on the Tangahau wetland, because the wetlands of northern Bangladesh are also very vulnerable and play a key role particularly uh, in supporting migratory bird species as well, of course, as supporting uh, the uh, ability of local people to make their living sustainably from the land. So those nature-based elements will be really important to, uh, to that program as it, uh, as it takes off. And another strand of that program is supporting the Global Centre on Adaptation, uh, which has established a locally-led adaptation hub here in Dhaka, uh, and we had Patrick Vershoyan, uh, the head of the Global Centre on Adaptation here in Dhaka yesterday. He's actually in Mongla today, uh, looking at locally led adaptation there. Uh, but that, I think, will be a good opportunity for the sort of expertise that exists in Bangladesh to be promoted uh, more widely around the world. And I just finish by saying that sometimes when you look at this agenda, uh, you find yourself almost giving in to a sort of existential despair. We know that we're over-consuming the resources of the planet. We can see evidence every day uh, of the emergency, whether it's floods here in, in Pakistan this year, whether it's 40 degree temperatures seen for the first time in the UK this summer. Wherever you look, there's evidence. Uh, but sometimes you can find hope. And I was lucky enough to go to Rangamati in the Chittagong Hill Tracks last month uh, to see a project which has two angles. And the most important one is the restoration of what had been a very degraded forest. Uh, and by taking on through a village community forest program, the community had worked with outside assistance to restore uh, a significant, a, a couple of hundred hectares of forest. And it's really remarkable. I have to say it was really inspiring to see the difference that that was already making in terms of the ability uh, of the forest to capture uh, and distribute water. So an area that is severely water stressed in the hill tracks, in this particular area, they now have much more abundant water as a result of restoring the forest both for uh, irrigation and also for drinking water. Uh, and that project was one of the ones that received uh, a global award at COP uh, as an example of what can be done uh, to restore nature and how that benefits not just uh, the environment, but also provides very direct and tangible benefits to the lives of the people in the village, particularly women. Women's voices are really important in this whole debate uh, and agenda. 
and the women who had to spend before hours fetching not very clean water from distant sources and then helping their children through waterborne diseases were now had easy access to clean water and it had made a transformational difference. Uh, so it just showed me that even though it's not on an enormous scale, it's an example of how you know the battle is not lost uh, and we can still win it if we apply ourselves in the way that this event I hope will help us all to do. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is uh, a really very uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, let me go straight to the uh, Eastern Himalayas and our whole, uh, the Bangladesh-India joint ecosystem of this. Uh. So one of the things we started with uh, mangroves and, uh, you know, there is no hard border there. And of course, from tigers to fish, everybody, uh, everything goes, uh, moves across. Uh, now, uh, in Western India, in Maharashtra, the area under mangroves has gone up every year. And it's, it's stupendous, the growth. While here, the area under mangroves is decreasing. One of the main things uh, to think, uh, remember about mangroves is it's very difficult, unlike other trees, to plant them. There are techniques now, but, but we don't need to plant mangroves. Just need, need to leave them alone. They grow on their own. Now, but how do you do that? Uh, so... If there is a farmer who's trying to cultivate paddy and then saline water comes in and mangroves come, so he has to build a dike to keep the saline water out. The moment he keeps the saline water out, the mangroves can't get in and therefore mangroves uh, go. But how much he gets from a, a, a acre of paddy, what we found is we have mangrove crabs, which are large ones, but they grow only in pure mangrove farms and there is a the place where you can regenerate them. So all along the coast of Western Maharashtra, previously they would collect the wild crabs, which is very destructive. But if private lands, which were being pushed into paddy cultivation through building of dikes to keep seawater, allowed mangroves to grow there or they where they were growing, and then you introduce this crab farming, it gives you a livelihood and allows mangroves to stay back. So, so this is the first thing. The second thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about is this whole thing about the traffic cascades. Everything is uh, connected. You know, I, was, uh, I don't know. I want to check with any one of you. Have you has anyone seen uh, the small film called Wolves Change Rivers? And the other one, which is Whales Make uh, Climate. Have you seen the other one? That's the second one. So let's start from that one because that's relevant to us. So whales are, of course, carnivorous. They eat fish. They eat krill. So Japan, for one, thought that if we keep harvesting whales, obviously the fish population would go up as their main carnivore has gone. But it went down tre tremendously. Then it was found that what whales do is they eat krills by going down. But when they go up, they leave their fecal plumes, which fertilizes the desert zone of the sea, which is the top area. And that allows plant plankton to come up, which allows the whole chain, including more fish, to come up. So with more waste. Now, how do we use this trophic cascade here in our place? So tigers, as I was telling in my morning story, return of tigers doesn't take life. It brings life back. So I think we can do a lot on the peace park between Sundarbans to ensure that tiger is just a barometer species. It's not important. With tiger come everything from the saline crocodiles to the birds. Because if a tiger can only survive if the mangroves are ecosystem-wise pure. So that's one peace park that can come up. Even if there are borders elsewhere, there are no borders. I used to work on the conflict zone in Africa a lot. And you know that South Africa and Mozambique fought a very rigorous war just post-independence. And Kruger National Park, which is on the border of uh, Mozambique, was fenced hard to keep all the elephants inside because there was too much poaching on that side. But they've broken the fences now. And the elephants go on both sides and the, both the parks have become. We don't need to do that in Sundarbans, but there are other places in India. For example, we have the Dampa Tiger Reserve, which is in Mizoram, and that has a good area on the Chittagong side. Uh, so these are the sorts of peace parks which have already come up in the Indian subcontinent in Manas, for example, where you know you have the Bhutan Manas and you have the Indian Manas and both sides are 
in a way co-managed. In fact, when we supported through IUC and a joint project, which helped uh, both countries, and it also helps to uh, in, uh, increase people-to-people -people, uh, contacts in this sector. So I would strongly urge that we work on this concept, which is a concrete action on the ground uh, uh, through these peace parks. My last thing is there is no shortage of money. We don't really have to look for all the time uh, for an aid because much of these ecosystems, that's the only point which I don't really agree with uh, Professor Parthadas Gupta and the others that, you know, it requires export subsidies to get in and all of that. Uh, it doesn't really. Uh, the, today, in, in, in an environment of roughly 100,000 square kilometers of the Maharashtra forests, tigers are paying more than 300,000 women their daily fuel replacement simply out of tourism fees. And we have a very restricted type of tourism in India. That is, you can just enter the safari through a gypsy and watch the animals. But if you go to Africa, as you have been, right from balloon safari to cycle trips to everything else, and we're just waiting for that to happen outside the parks. This gives a non-extractive source of income, which allows biodiversity to mostly pay for itself, at least to the local people. And, and, the, and the last issue being local communities. If you give ownership for getting a recurring income without destroying the asset base, most communities have a very long-term view because unlike us who migrate from place to place, uh, the reason why Swiss villages or the Japanese mountain villages or up till now Nepalese villages were so intact because a father knew that his son is going to stay here and his son's son is going to stay there. So he's not going to destroy the landscape in a way that his children cannot uh, get sustenance from it. And that's why, you know, in the Swiss, uh, you have local laws which prevail that in a Swiss village, if the village decides only 100 cattle can stay there, nobody can just say that I, on, it's my land, I'll get 25 more uh, cattle. No, they, they govern this because they know if they remove the pasture, their son's son, who will come later on, won't have any pasture out there. So to provide this longitudinal view to local communities, particularly those who don't have the option to migrate, we need to support their local rules by formal law. Our formal laws don't support these rules. And therefore, then they break it down and become each for each. That is, you take out as much as you can, therefore. So with this, I think we can really build back a solution which is both ours and which is sustainable and not always dependent on influx of foreign funds. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I'm I'm amazed at at what you have been doing in Maharashtra. I've had occasion uh, opportunity myself to see how your many of your other national parks are managed, and I think there's a lot we can learn from there. The important thing is, I think we need to be sharing this information with each other. We need to have the forum where we sit down and say, uh, you and we we have similar things, but why are we getting up with different results? And, and I think here, uh, development partners, uh, particularly uh, you and others, <clears throat> can help to facilitate this dialogue process. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, that was the other thing that partition rendered. The dialogue stopped. We are resuming the dialogues, but it's still a learning process, and there's still a long way to go. Um, we started late, I know. Uh, and and uh, I have the unhappy task of trying to make up for lost time as much as possible. I will give one minute more to each of our speakers if they have any closing thoughts, uh, reactions from whatever has been said by the fellow speakers here, uh, if they would like to, and then wind up with something. That will not be worth it. Thank you. I'll just elaborate uh, within one minute uh, the points that I uh, made at the onset. Probably uh, my topics will be a little different from other erudite speakers that we have. You see, uh, I talked about bioethanol from bamboo. See, bamboo is a, a plant which can be grown in the entire uh, that sub Himalayan region, uh, right up to Bangladesh. And a bamboo. Uh, has a carbon sink which is much higher than the normal tree and it grows very fast. So if we responsibly harvest and make fuel out of it, this, is, this will uh, give a lot of money back to the farmer. The size of plant that we have to make around 60 KTPA of uh, ethanol, 
we have estimated that al- around 24 million dollar of worth of material we are going to buy from the customer which includes the services that we uh, that we, that they will provide the in our model what we say that we will pay directly to the grower the at the village level chipping will be done because we need the chipped bamboo the chipping will be done that fellow will get something and the transporters will also get something then we have calculated the carbon emitted in the whole process so you have uh, carbon emission in the transportation process you have carbon emission in the fermentation process which is an integral part of making ethanol from bamboo because first you get to get to uh, glucose then you uh, make ethanol uh, with the help of yeast so that carbon we are trying to capture and make dry ice or some utility that we will have another place where carbon is emitted is uh, your burning of that uh, lignin which is left out to produce the power which is required to run the plant but the kind of carbon sink which we are creating by regrowing the bamboo is more than offsetting the whole carbon emission there so it is a absolutely carbon neutral process barring the scope 3 emission that means the fuel that i am offering to the market will have at least two carbon uh, that uh, ethanol so by burning that you will emit something but if you leave that aside and as a transition fuel, it is an excellent method to do. Unless we get directly to green hydrogen when it comes, then it's a different thing. But IC engine are ready. They can use this fuel. That's why I would like to make a pitch here so that even Bangladesh can look very, very seriously about producing ethanol once we meet success with this plan. We will be very happy to share whatever knowledge that we have on this. Thank you. Uh, so very quick thoughts. I think you mentioned about the uh, the, the mechanism we have on the uh, Sundarbans, uh, 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 the the JWG on conservation, uh, and the, there's another one sir on JWG on conservation on transboundary conservation of Royal Bengal tigers. I think we really need to make the best use of them. Uh, I know they were launched when you were the High Commissioner uh, of Bangladesh in, in India. Uh, way back in 2011, and we really need the, these. These providers very robust mechanisms to uh, not just continue with what we are doing, finding our own pathways for ecological uh, conservation, biodiversity conservation, but also share experiences and share best practices and help each other in capacity building. I think we have both to learn from each other uh, in 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 this. Uh, there are many uh, success stories that we have uh, on on the Indian side, and you know you would have heard about the uh, the tiger population uh, doubling in a in a record time. The Asiatic lions have been uh, have have really grown in 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 numbers in India. We have actually uh, very interestingly uh, uh, we come we accomplished one of the one of the world's probably first. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe there, there are the others also. I, I didn't know of uh, uh, intercontinental uh, uh, rehabilitation. It's called the uh, uh, intercontinental rehabilitation program. Where cheetahs were brought uh, from Africa uh, to India after 70 years, the cheetahs were de- declared extinct in 1952, and we actually br- we have we have brought uh, a, a, you know a, a full uh, a set of them to India and trying to rehabilitate them. If it succeeds, and we are confident it will, because we have done a lot of research before that, I think these are really examples of how we can actually uh, 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 help each other in in learning from our best practices towards conservation, uh, uh, both of wildlife as well as uh, uh, you know sundarbans and mangroves that you that you mentioned. Uh, the aspect of traditional knowledge that uh, uh, Mr. Pardesi mentioned, I think is very important. Um, that's something that we often lose sight of in trying to find new solutions to uh, ecological problems. And uh, again, here, I think there has been a significant change in the mindset at which we are looking at uh, traditional communities and their uh, traditional knowledge that they have developed for ecological preservation. We are actually incentivizing by making heroes of people who have applied those traditional knowledge uh, with some great success. You know, a lady called Tulsi Gowda is uh, was given the, one of our highest national awards. She's known as Encyclopedia of Forest. She has, she has found 600 
endangered species of uh, plants and planted them over the last six, de six decades that she has been uh, um, campaigning for uh, lost species. Uh, similarly, there is a tribe in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, it's called Bugun. They have worked with the forest department of the state to actually develop a, a, a reserve for a bird which is only found in that area in the entire world and 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 preserving uh, that uh, conserving that bird species so i think traditional knowledge is really important and uh, uh, also the issue of ecotourism i think they are really uh, something that can provide the uh, that can act as an economic enabler for the development of that area in a very very symbiotic manner where you achieve your ecological conservation goals by providing uh, an incentive economic incentive for people uh, to 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 continue to preserve that so um, those are my uh, last bits of uh, perspectives thanks thank you thank you robert you have some questions thank you well i know i'm almost the last speaker before lunch, so I'll be very brief. I think we've heard a lot this morning about the urgency of the problem, uh, and I think the sort of cultural change is very much a work in progress, uh, and I hope that events like this can play a part in helping people to think differently uh, about the way in which we use and live from, off and with nature. Thank you. I'll just uh, make uh, two points, one taking on from what Pranay just said. Uh, about this uh, Sundarban. So, you know, I have a dream. And uh, it around 1880s, the last two-horned rhinoceros was shot in Sundarbans. You know, India had all three. India, that is the sub subcontinent, had all three species. The one-horned rhinoceros, which still survives, of course, on Brahmaputra. The two-horned rhinoceros was in this part. Uh, now it just survives a few numbers in Myanmar. If India and uh, Bangladesh co cooperate to bring the two-horned rhinoceros back, uh, in this area, the rhinoceros is life-giving. Any keystone species, as I was telling you about the whales, they bring life back. If you, I mean, just I want to tell you of these figures. You know, Taroba National Park used to earn twenty-one thousand dollars. Today, it earns three million dollars per year. Tigers. What, what Pranay just said about doubling of the tiger numbers. So you bring rhinos here, you have a huge livelihood for people to pay for. My last point is on the bamboos. Be careful on one front. Ensure that the bamboos are taken from farm-grown bamboos. You see, all over India, from Madhya Pradesh to South India to Northeast India, wild bamboo is almost now not regenerating because of over-extraction. But as you rightly said, China and rest of the world can learn. Farmland need to go under bamboo because we don't need so much of cultivated area, both for the ecology and for that. So that's all. Thank you very much. I mean, two important takeaways here. One, that local communities, it has to be a bottom-up process. The local people with the local tradition and knowledge has to be mainstreamed into whatever uh, economists and ecologists and others will bring in. Uh, because ultimately, those are theories which are at a higher level with very often little connection to the ground level. So that uh, gap needs to be bridged. Number two, as uh, from both from Mr. Pukan and from you, we heard how you can actually persuade the coastline farmers who are including into the turf of what used to be mangrove territory to bring back the mangrove and still make profit out of it. And, and similarly, in, in the bamboo, the same thing. Uh, if people can be shown that no, they are not going to lose, uh, lose income, but they can generate income and perhaps more income in the, in the medium and long term. Then perhaps that is the incentive which will uh, lead to the rewilding that we are talking about. And, and uh, uh, with these remarks, uh, uh, I'll bring this uh, very, very fruitful and, and uh, uh, intellectually stimulating discussion to a close. Uh, I think the announcers uh, uh, are, are waiting impatiently to invite you, <laughs> invite the lunch break, and then the resumption after the lunch break. Thank you all very much. A big hand of, a round of applause for everyone. <clears throat> Announcement for results. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, for, thank you very much, uh, our esteemed dignitaries, to share your valuable thoughts, ideas, and experiences with all of us. And now, uh, I'd like to request our dear students to remain seated, please.